Thank you to our friends at the Huntington for providing this beautiful venue and for all of you here for attending tonight. It was a special love for poetry and a realization that serious and gifted writers needed help to keep going that prompted the establishment of these award, awards. Kingsley and Kate Tufts understood the beauty and power of words. And if they were alive today, Twitter and texting would probably horrify them. They were both deeply committed to poetry and its survival in the modern world. Kingsley was a poet, a musician, an executive in LA's shipyards, who published 11 books of poetry and prose in his lifetime, and who died while reading his verse to a group of friends. Kate Tufts, after marrying Kingsley, left her job as a teacher to devote herself to supporting her husband's creative work. You may not realize this, but after Kingsley's death, Kate Tufts established the awards and financed them by selling her, her family home. These awards are built on Kate's very moving sacrifice to support the art of poetry. The Tufts Awards recognize poets at two very important stages in their careers, at the beginning and in the middle. Kate said that she hoped that the awards would help them, quote, have enough time to really concentrate on their craft without having to worry about the bills or some nasty little jobs somewhere. <laughs> the Kingsley Tufts Awards provide $100,000 to the winner and the Kate Tufts Discovery Award provides 10,000 to its winner. And hopefully this is enough to keep those nasty little jobs at bay so that you have more time to write. Before I finish, I would like to introduce the interim director of the Kingsley and Kate Tufts Poetry Awards, Don Scher. Don is the editor of Poetry Magazine. His most recent books are Wishbone, Union, and Bunting's Persia and he has edited a critical edition of Basil Bunting's poems, as well as an edition of Bunting's selected prose. His translations of Miguel Hernandez were awarded the Times Literary Supplement Translation Prize, and his other books include Seneca in English, The Open Door, 100 Poems, 100 Years of Poetry Magazine, and Who Reads Poetry? 50 Views from Poetry Magazine. His work at Poetry has been recognized with three national magazine awards for editorial excellence from the American Society of Magazine Editors, and he has received a VITA, Women in Literary Arts VITA Award, for his contributions to American literature and, liter and literary community. In recent years, Don has been a devoted steward and guiding light of these awards. We are so grateful for his involvement. Please join me in welcoming Don, who will introduce our two extraordinary poets for this year. How are y'all? Everybody good? Thank you. <laughs> well, as you've just heard, the Tufts Poetry Awards, based at Claremont Graduate University, and given for poetry books published in the preceding year are not only two of the most prestigious prizes a contemporary poet can receive, they also come with sizable checks, as you just heard. $100,000 for the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award and $10,000 for the Kate Tufts Discovery Award. And this makes the Kingsley Tufts Award the world's largest monetary prize for a single collection of poetry. And for most poets who've just published their first collection of verse, $10,000 should keep the pen moving. Um, as Patricia mentioned, unlike many literary awards, which are kind of coronations for a successful career or a body of work, the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award was created both to honor the poet and provide the resources that allow artists to continue working towards the pinnacle of their craft. And this year's winner, Don Lundy Martin, is at that pinnacle now, as you'll discover. Kate Tufts, Kingsley's widow and creator of the award, said she wanted to create a prize that would, as you again heard, enable a poet to work on his or her craft for a while without paying bills. And so the Kate Tufts Discovery Award was created in 1994, a year after the inception of the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. And it's presented to a first book, by a poet of genuine promise, in this case, Diana Khoi Nguyen, and her book, Ghost Of. Now, both of these poets are really exciting because they're innovators of the language and textures of poetry. 
and both use things outside language alone in their respective books, both of which include poignant and powerfully intriguing visual elements. As our judging panel chair, who will be up here in a second, Timothy Donnelly said, they are probably different from what many people are used to or expect from poetry. Martin and Wynne capture a whole new layer of being in their work that to many will still be unfamiliar. And we rely on poets, as you all know, to explore and help us explore the unfamiliar as well as the things we think we know. And so now let me bring the chair of this year's judging committee, Timothy Donnelly, up to talk more about the poet poets to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be part of this process this, um, this year. Um, I myself was fortunate enough to win the Kingsley Tufts Prize back in 2012 for a book of my own. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now I'm a little embarrassed. I didn't mention it for the applause, but I do appreciate it. Uh, and uh, I will tell you that it absolutely did make a tremendous difference in my life to, to, to be awarded. Uh, well, the distinction was terrific, but the money, um, well, that made things happen. Uh, I have the pleasure tonight of introducing uh, the winner of the uh, Kate Tufts uh, Poetry Award, uh, Diana Koi Nguyen. Uh, and uh, I'll just read a few comments. I'll be brief uh, in order to prepare you to uh, hear what she will be reading tonight, which will be uh, undoubtedly uh, extraordinary. Uh, one evening, a man and a woman, parents of two daughters, watch Oliver Twist, 1948, go to sleep, and in the morning, name their only son, Oliver. The family rejoices, even though they are industrious refugees who previously celebrated nothing. So begins the title poem of Diana Coy Nguyen's unforgettable first book, Ghost Of, winner of this year's Kate Tufts Poetry Award. Selected by Terence Hayes for Omnidon Publishing's open competition and published by them in 2018, Ghost Of is a painstakingly composed, impeccably assembled sequence of verse, prose, images, and collage all written around and in response to the suicide of the poet's little brother, that same Oliver, whose naming once brought such joy. My fellow judges and I marveled at each of the finalists of this year's Kate. We truly did, and I can recommend each of them to you loudly and wholeheartedly. But Ghost Of is in its own category. Imagine the most confounding and irreparable agony converted right before your eyes into a dazzling tribute to endurance, to love, and ultimately to life itself. That should give you some idea of what Nguyen has achieved here with this book. Imagine a book so scrupulous with its language that reading it feels like a cleanse in the best sense, or one whose formal innovations are so urgent they feel determined by fate itself, or one whose complicated affect mimics the tense dynamic of a family that has had to steel itself against and in the wake of trauma after trauma. It withholds, it pauses, suppresses, distorts, circles around, deflects, expresses tautly but sideways, dodges, then cracks open and gushes frantically into a deluge of lyric insistence. That should give you some idea. But don't let me not get particular about it. There are images here that will startle you, like the jet black inkwell of my eye that spills into a drove of ants. There are utterances that will haunt and trouble you, like each day I become the dog I abandon, and those that will expand your perception, like there is nothing that is not music, the pouring of water from one receptacle to another, a coat of bees draped over the sack, of sugar caving in on itself. That should give you some idea. And there are admissions here and images and insights of such power you will finish the book feeling you have been living another life. Poets, God bless them, talk all the time about alchemy. We really do. I would say it's getting old, but it's obviously ancient to begin with, so what would be the point? <laughs> 
But the notion that we might be able to take the base metal of our drabest or even darkest experiences and transform them into invaluable light shedding gold substance of art is, for many of us, the dream. And every now and then, you come across a book that reminds you what alchemy looks like when it happens. And that's what we have here. A book of rivenings that can't be undone, but through which can issue skeins of devotion and radiant song. A book with such impossible weightiness that it has taught itself to levitate, because it had to. Please welcome the fierce magician, the exquisite sister, the alchemist, the linguistic gymnast, the indubitable poet behind this year's Kate Tufts Poetry Award, Ghost of Diana Koi Nguyen. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you for all of you for spending your is it Thursday? This Thursday evening with us here in celebration of myself, and Dawn. Um, I couldn't have dreamed of this. I mean, I think of this like maybe the finalist list. I'm so grateful to the Tufts family, the readers and the workers who've toiled and read and organized to make all this happen. And for all of you who care about poetry, I mean, none of this I think would matter if it were not also for your attention and your care. Thank you for sharing this moment tonight. A bird in Chile and elsewhere. There is no ecologically safe way to mourn. Some plants have nectaries that keep secreting pollen even after the petals have gone, like a flower that grows only in the invisible, the whole world of its body noiselessly shaking against the dust. I also have to say a good number of my family members, immediate and also extended, are here. And it's a different experience for me to read this book, which revolves in and around us, you know, and I mean, of course, it extends beyond the larger ecosystem of all of us, but I get especially emotional. And this book in particular is, is for my sister, who's also here in the front row. Don't look, she'll get really embarrassed, <laughs> but she's here. Her name is Denise. Overture. Around a pool of sorghum, thief ants lower their mouths and twitch in the feed, each animal growing by accretion, vote by vote, the theory of seconds increasing until the clock starts over, the paycheck, DNA. How long until the rice is ready? How long has the rice been ready? I feel my hair growing and know not what it means. When we drove across train tracks, I threw my arms across my brother's lap to absorb shock. The question remains, which of us had the best life? I can't be sure, but this will sting, I said, when I held my mother and put my brother's hand back beside his body. The ants move closer, closer, and closer. The ants move into my camera and move on. The ants move into my head, my mouth. I taste the ants. I swallow the ants. A spider could have woven around my mouth like a room, a kiss, a woman still burying herself, pulling off the world like fly's wings. The distance between sugar stores is grief. I belong to a club that gets salt each month from a sea I've never inhabited. My mother scattered his ashes into the sea, and each night I draw a bath with ashes from incense. The real sea, a sound with music and water. 
in the future, is it possible to alter the half-lives of isotopes? I cannot see the future for myself or any of my doubles, but I see the days ahead of him. Surely it cannot go on much longer, this desert oasis. Surely it cannot go on much longer, this desert in which the jet black inkwell of my eye spills, staining the ants who come to see. The Exodus, Saigon to Los Angeles, 1975 to 2015. For a long time, it didn't seem possible. Then the whispering grew louder, the blur and hum of synchronous movements, as in a murmuration, leaderless, with the shades drawn. A poet, burning his life's work. A mother, measuring out small bottles of poison. As my grandfather and his sons were ushered through the droves, remorse rose up in him, tear gas bowling over and over and over. Then, everyone became equals, each one disappearing in the shadow of another touch, as a bird rarely seen unless believed in, wretched. A youth points a toy gun at her chin, stupid girlish pleasure rising for a moment. Still, every living body finds a routine, no matter its damage. Two minutes after I was born, I had already made my first evacuation. Years later, when I found myself in Saigon, I bought a lighter at the war market. Etched on one side was a nude woman, reclined with her legs spread, an owl at her sex, one wing in, the other wing out, two owls standing by. Why should we mourn? Isn't this the history we want? One in which we survive? After many days at sea, my mother's guised boat found rescue. A young man collapsed and died beside her, the journey's end too much to bear. Before my brother was born, all four of us slept beside one another in one bed. In an effort to resist memory, my mother asked me to shake her awake. The nights before the monks came to usher my brother out of the realm of the living, we gathered on the same bed, sifting through photos and stories of him. At the funeral, his hand was warm, or my mother would not let go. Maybe you'd forget why you were here, that you didn't belong, that just because it was like life didn't mean it could be life that you could come back to life but not return to living. And if you bypassed a war, a war wouldn't bypass you. For a good deal of my life, after my, I got my MFA, I think my mother described my life as driftwood. She said, you can't keep being driftwood. I'm worried about you. And I understand that. And I was also was like, well, it's hard to be a poet, you know? And yes, how do we pay the bills? I have to say, this distinction, not only, I think, uh, I can't even do the extended metaphor here, but my driftwood is now in a house. It doesn't have to see water anymore, unless I want to take it to water intentionally. And I think there's a lot of relief for my parents too. And of course, for, for me, and it means a lot too that they're not worried about me. Although I'm never worried about me, but I'm not a parent of myself. Um, so I'm so grateful for, for this. And also 
the resources allow me to kind of continue my projects. I mean, this past December, I went to Vietnam, to Saigon. I only went to Saigon, and my father accompanied me, and he showed me the house where he was raised, born and raised, and my uncle, who is here too, was born and raised, and the alley in which they played, and the school that they went to, and how much things have changed since then. And we took a lot of footage, because my father is perpetually filming, and I don't know if he knows this, but I've been watching the footage where I think I'm four years old. My sister is two. My brother's not yet born. And my parents were building the house that they live in now in Palos Verdes. And so I think a lot about that footage of me and my father in Saigon, but also the footage of my father narrating this, you know, kind of wooden stilts house in Palos Verdes. And I think how far we have all come and how far yet we have to go. the human journey, right? I don't usually read from this series. It's called Kyotaku, which is the Japanese form of printing in which you apply ink to one side of a fish and then you press the fish against paper or, or muslin, kind of a before photography, but even in the world of photography, a way to capture what has been captured. And I think it's such a beautiful form of art to think about the now no longer living body as a stamp, right? And ideograph in a sense. And to think also, well, aren't, isn't that what language is, text is, publishing is on the page? You know, pictures being printed and imprinted over and over. And the idea of doing that with a body of text, especially a body of text that I used in place of where my brother cut himself out of family portraits. So kind of, the poem is a body of something that's no longer here, but then to play with the materiality and the decay of that. Um, so that's what the kind of series engages in. And it will also say, this is where I, I share my obsession, if you don't know already, with eels. One, longevity, yes. Okay, regardless of whether or not you want to eat them. But maybe you didn't know this, but the adolescent stage of the eel, the elver, I know, I love that word, Elver. I mean, it also has the last three syllables of my brother's name, Oliver. And that's what my parents called him, Ver, which is kind of a shorthand nickname within our house. And so I was drawn to the Elver because it kind of contained in part, part of the body of my brother's name. But also the adolescent stage, the Elver, is when it goes from where it's born in the ocean deep to fresh water, a place it's never been before. And that journey is quite singular and arduous, especially in light of dams and other kind of man-made structures. So sometimes, and you too can do this on YouTube, but you can watch the elvers go on land like a snake and also climbing up dam walls. And I, I watched these videos of this adolescent eel struggling and I felt such compassion for my brother and in, in, in his adolescence and in his 20s. And so that's kind of the obsession. It became a something concrete that I can map my grief and um, sorrow through. Giyotaku. Ran through the ribbon of his life, illy, eel-like. Born and not born, the eel returns upstream, up dam walls, waterfalls, winding, winchless. She fails her vow to defeat death. So cells divide, live, divide. Elver, Elver, Oliver, Elver, Elver, Oliver, Oliver, Elver, Oliver, 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 Elver, 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 Oliver, Elver, Oliver, Elver. Over, Oliver, Elver, Oliver, El, Oliver, Oliver, Ver, Ver, Elver, Oliver, Ver, 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 O, Ever, Live, Ver. And the last poem I'm going to read is from the series of triptychs, which engages first a photograph in which my brother has removed himself 
And then there's the body text of which I spoke. But then lastly, if you haven't yet seen it, the text as a body which supports what is no longer here, which I thought was integral for the kind of trinity of, of that, that process for the whole, whole with a W, not, not with that. Triptych. Mindful of this setting, he counted off the seconds in his head as the solitary bee struggles to fly inside the walls of an empty house. Her sister's dead below her. No wind, no rain. We stayed. Framing. An act of enclosing, of closing off yourself from your environment, and all the unintended sounds, car stereos, solitary bird in the tree, the male mouse alone in his cell who detects the trace of a female, pattering rain, neighbors upstairs spilling rice across the floors and slipping constantly, the drone of sister bees in the walls of your room lost for weeks, months, and each afternoon you wake to find a new bee on your windowsill, all wings still, and all the days unfold like this until you are not at the window window, but the dead bees continue to come still, coming to a moment of our attention, framing, to get lost between the walls and open the mind to music. One must remove oneself or framing will remove you. You could not remove the bee that kept reappearing. The sisters were unending. You could not remove the drone, the hum inside your mind. You removed your mind. Open the mind. All sounds are music. I am listening to a needle drop. 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 I am listening to. I am dropping all the needles. I keep on dropping the needles. I have always dropped the. Uh, needles. The needles are stacked in my palm, in the palm of my hand, of my mind, my hands and O's, the environment of the needles. What can you hear in the amplified cactus of this palm of mine? Pay attention. Each time the thrums of a dishwasher are different. Let me not be the only listener wishing that the music could go on a little longer unintended sounds and all let me e not be the only let me not be let me not this stupid amplified cactus begging for some new ouch to framing to listening to unintended unattended i will attend to you listening in a moment Int of attention to life my mind is open to the fact let me beg let me blur these boundaries in life and soundlessness. I will do all the exercises. I will listen to all that drops. Please be not art, but life. Be life. Please be here. A simple explanation for resistance. Our human ears have vulnerability ability to unfamiliar sounds. When you hear these sounds and feel trapped, you must remove yourself from what surrounds you. These sounds, these sounds, we have vulnerability to unfamiliar. Remove yourself from frames. Remove the frame. Remove the do not panic. Do not panic is the simplest explanation, the simplest resistance to music. Do not simply resist resist. We who are free to move around, who are free, bewilder. We bewilder what we fill in. What bewilders us to fill in what? Thank you. We have another round of applause for Diana, please. Thank
thank you all again for being here. Uh, thank you to the Tufts family, to Don Cher, um, to my fellow judges uh, for the Kingsley and Kate Tufts Poetry Award. I am here to introduce Don Lundy Martin, the Kingsley Tufts winner for her book, Good Stock, Strange Blood. In her landmark 1992 critical text, Playing in the Dark, Toni Morrison writes of typical white literary critics, what is surprising is that their refusal to read black texts, a refusal that makes no disturbance in their intellectual life, repeats itself when they reread the traditional established works of literature. It is interesting to me, and by interesting I mean unsurprising, a little bit annoying, that such established literature, Moby Dick, Paradise Lost, The Wasteland perhaps, to name just three, such established literature is often described as difficult. Yet we tend to resist new texts that seem difficult, that demand our precious time and thought with no apparent guarantee of reward. While the established works I mentioned succeed in telling us what their authors think and believe about culture via allegory, Martin's work does as well, and her, her book further asks us to identify, interrupt, and interrogate our own thought patterns, to surrender the usual narrative in favor of something that doesn't feel very easy to understand at first for some. But has surrender to change ever been easy, especially when it comes to race in this country? Good Stock, Strange Blood is a black book it is black in the indefinable, impossible, inscrutable ways blackness is, exists, persists. It is hard, painful, too much. But Martin positions black thought in a place of strength. She writes of the black in the black body, a tremor so tender. And if one could be giddy with difference, this is it. Such precision of embodied feeling, of communicating an apparent dichotomy of fear and tenderness, joy alongside the exclusion that difference intimates, means that her work encompasses both thinking and feeling, enacting the process of making out of our fragmented human existence a fraught and vibrant wholeness. The first note I wrote upon finishing Good Stock, Strange Blood this book is a system of thought. With her multivalent work, Martin invites us to experience black intellect, strength, difficulty, beauty, creativity, our true worlds as complex and multidimensional, even as it seems untenable and unbearable. Somehow, messily and magnificently, we do bear it, we do live through, and make ourselves excel and love despite impossible and deadly odds. Any existence inside of both loss and abundance feels impossible, she writes. And yet, awarding this book means we value Black imagination and creative output, past and present pain, self-determination, and future transformations. Good Stock, Strange Blood uses question and story, allegory and history, dialogue and observation, theory and poetry, to authenticate the process of creating as thinking, to depict blackness, not as incomprehensible, but uncontainable, and to show racism as the actual unbearable, unconscionable thing, the malignant source of persistent trauma. Is the world going to change? And will that terror ever end without doing what the poet Lucille Clifton wanted to do, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And as James Baldwin has said, art should disturb the peace, especially if that peace means denial and stagnation. Martin's book on its own terms and without asking for permission, uses imagination to put the onus on the reader, whose first instinct is often to ignore, resist, and reject change, to evolve, to effort, and to embrace a new understanding. And for those who felt and thought in our most secret sensibilities what Martin's book articulates, we now have a work of language 
that empowers and validates us. Renowned fiction writer Octavia Butler, whose papers are housed here at the Huntington, wrote in her novel Parable of the Sower that the only lasting truth is change. Discomfort and difficulty are the signals of a shift. This award signals that we can indeed reject the status quo. It signals that we are interested in the power of language to shift cultural belief toward evolution and radical inclusion, to strengthen the reader's intellectual stamina. As Martin writes, we think there is escape, but there is no escape. The material is always the same, yet it is malleable. malleable. To mutate is to live. Our next generation is looking at us to see what gets valued. Let us value imagination and continue to recognize the possibility inherent in living poetry. Readers, thinkers, fellow humans alive in this moment, please join me in welcoming 2019's winner of the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award, Dr. Don Lindy Martin. Thank you, Khadija, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you all for being here. I have to say, I, you know, I continue to be overwhelmed by um, this award, by this experience, by um, joining my distinguished heroes um, as a Kingsley Tuss winner. Um, April 8th was my birthday, so it, this is the best birthday present. <laughs> I turned 51, so it's not only <laughs> a, a mid-career award, it's a, a mid-life award. <laughs> um, so, yes, thank you. I, I um, strangely haven't yet decided what I will read to you. Um, I think I want to feel it out. Um, and I don't want to read in a sequential way um, because I want you to understand a little about um, the way the book is supposed to work. Um, it's divided into sections, and I'll read you those sections, actually, so you'll have you know, some orientation, since I'm about to probably disorient you. Okay. Um, uh, first, there's the prologue, which I read last night. There is the baby book. There's the black bits, the other baby book. There's the section we believe in regarding the nature of being. There's the book of love, because I wanted some love in the book. There's some black unknown because black is always unknown. There's counterband, tangentials, and then there's operatic. The book escapes the book. As um, Khadija mentioned, there's an attention in this collection to the human condition, but also the embodied condition of being black. There um, is some sexual trauma in the book, and there's also this attempt at sexual agency. And um, in some ways, the two, sexual agency and sexual trauma, don't really get untethered from each other. I'll start with the baby book. To be in covering. To be in covering is the problem. Hunger caverns under this leather wrap from destitution, from split skull. Mother as brown as, brawn and braided toward filth beneath, skin like wire, all our kin. From before it happened when dust underfoot, red dick stuck under guise of reason. 
who summons us from darkness, from water, while one philtrum stitched to wool of tongue, who tugs and rocks us, suckles wet mouth. We is the purpose of the falling, swollen. Our teeth hurt their constant cutting. Warm when sunken, wanted the swell of black earth, a legacy, something larger than ourselves to hold us. If we were looking from the outside, if we were looking from the outside, I'd think that a thing ancient would not pulse so loudly, would be automatically removed from the atmosphere, lose its atomic structure, its relatability. We were driven or we were rode hard, mule-like on feathers, this notion of sustainability, black vultures everywhere, neat white stars under wings, good at cleaning up road carcasses. What a mess, mess, your weak veins, your lifelong addictions, what you then must witness is the vulture devouring the exposed red and fly-soaked un recognizable. The book. The book of repression. All the stuff brilliantly cocking my throat. No dream remembered. No past reconstructed. He, he called it a kiss, but that was no kiss. Rises dead breath into smoke. The writing is not balm. The eye in sleep is unreachable. Subtle flesh, skin warm, milk, salt marsh. Its simplicity without warning. In my early 30s, I had one recurring dream so vivid it began to feel like a memory rather than a dream. It's the only dream worth recounting. At some point, I no longer held the dream, just the memory of the dream told. And often I'd get confused as to the nature of non-dreamed life. In a giant old abandoned house at the top of a hill, it's night and I'm furtively burying a man's body under some floorboards. I pull up the floorboards and then I'm outside digging a grave with my hands. It's easy, this digging, and I know there will be no evidence of this activity. I'm free to carve out soil in big rough scoops. Even though I know I won't get caught, my body is racked with guilt, but I cannot stop. The burial is necessary and compelled, so I scrape the earth, bludgeon it with bloody fingers, then place his body into the shallow grave, replacing the floorboards no one will ever know. Elision into vowels, sunken time, O oh, sounds, ow, oh, short, flat, ah, for as long as. My brother bends away from the hose that beats him. Basement is a watery place. I think of privacy and houses, what they allow for, their intimacy of enclosure. We never heard a word from over there and they never heard a word from us. How the home seals off the world, creates a hole in the world and there is no joy in that. To watch a teenage boy compressed and the heart still beats his hiss is what hatred made. God will not save you. A last leaf under cover, a last leaf under cover. Three days in bed, you think hurry and get to the real black bits or no one will care. You have no sage advice, you are no magic black, there's no head to rub. I play a game. I'm living a normal life in utter aloneness, fossil of aloneness. When I slice off a chunk of my finger with the sharpest knife, wonder if anyone in town will be up for a fuck. The book is not writing itself in the chilled gray day. Mother at 83, labor or resurrection, labor 
or resurrection is stunned to find out that people remember their dreams. Mother at 83 is stunned to find out that people remember their dreams. Occasionally, she says, not vividly. I tell her, me too, but we are not like many other people. I want to provide a metaphor for darkness. I want to tell you that the other day while writing this very book, I became piercingly depressed as if a bird had crashed into the window. And when I'm depressed, I want to feel worse because that can be a comfort. My brick feet, my open casket with the hole in my chest exposed so you can see right through the body, the glossy wood through the floor, and then the layers of earth, catacombs, and rites of passage. I searched for the man who notched the hole could not remember the spelling of the name in my mouth so many times. Shiny perpendicular, my cunt wet all day, legions of waste in my body, desecration, defunct, a symphony. I took a photograph of him, this man, and realized it was not me in the casket at all, but him. I stuff gauze into the wicker box that has become life source. Fluent gnaw. Oh, this is where I keep him tucked. I say to myself, this is where he lived. His obituary is perfectly respectable. What is this dead language? No one. No one will admit the facts of the matter, even though log books provide the material. They look at the gloves and say, gloves, that's it. And you're hoisted up on stretcher, paraded through crowded streets, contortion of hacked body, green grass, green grass, green grass, green grass, green grass, green grass, grows. Only I see my stranger to split, to be spilled, to topple, to be top, to strain, be stained, strangled. Robe falls open against my belly, stroked. Black stars fill up black sky. A dark stairwell up two flights to shag rug. I will lie here for a long while. I will be unspectacular and limp when the opal stone appears. I'll lean into it, but terror is a runaway train. Is deer head left on side of road, those gentle deer eyes staring softly at nothing. If the stone works at all, it's easy to catapult my body up the gymnasium rope knot by knot, a willowy thing until relief under billowing fragrance of the parachute. All our little forms cross-legged in wonder. When I stand now at the edge of the earth, night close and tight around me, no difference between what was undreamed and what happened. For example, my stranger ever beckoning, black eyed and grinning, or is it me who dislodges packed dirt from the hole the earth made? Symptomatic of being a slave is to forget you're a slave, to participate in industry as a critical piece in its motor. At night, you fall off the wagon because it's like falling into yourself. Fetish object. Deploy sensory mechanism. Deploy sound cannon. Blow their fucking eardrums out. Shoot them at close range if you can. Rationale of the uninterrogated actual in the side yard. Bright wind takes sprinklers, sprinkles up into sunlight. I call for my stranger. I long for him. I look for him in the face of every black ghost on the edge of every piss-stinking park can taste Bacardi breath, the long toe of it lapping against skin pressure and what can't happen and does. 
an imprint, how the living, slender living room window looks out onto the street, a sofa perpendicular to window in front of TV. The kitchen table for mica, my feet dangling, or was it the motel that one time? Who allows, who doesn't say wait into a room full of bicycles where the children fetch their toys, a thing you don't want can make you ravenous, can open the sturdiest lip with its faint presence. To shed the traces of catastrophe, a glow, this bent body, itch of layer, knot of hair, they call us Negro. To stand broad-footed in sensation of being lit up. No monument, only blood earth. Warm salve to open throat bone. How to live between mother and time. As if born into the self, watching the self already made formless than out of clay. Feel the hump of our drape. Hear the body, flesh, inevitable, unsatiated hunger like a whip. Instrumental fissure, instrumental fish. Whose rasp, a book, a whip, a story left in the dark body. To reach fingers out toward shine of morning, eyes squinted, and find there only cord grass some smoke or warning. He said, if they would only just beat or shoot me, but they wanted soul substance to harbor that like that so I could never move from this place. They reach cracked hands inside and hold me open for raking. Our name, what is our name? Where are the buttons holding us in place? What is place outside of time? Outside of memory, unstitched, unsnatch, swell into our mother's, quote, blackened skin, her, quote, tarnished, quote, whiteness, her rope shackled to grandfather's black neck, a picket, a thicket, Rice, cotton, sugar, potato, cow peas, turnips, and rye. Oh, Lord, thank you, Mr. Hopeton, not selling my boy. This is the body bending over another. The proposition that compels the book is already flawed. Hovering somewhere between memory and fantasy, repetition and desperation, I know how you cock your head. You'll ask, what is memory? But what I mean is that any existence inside of both loss and abundance feels impossible. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Don't rob Peter to pay Paul. Somehow, after all these years, I'm still alive. I cannot stand to exist against the banal. I'd rather be a monster than live inside of your cereal box. And I was a monster, wasn't I? Did I grin when you suffered an estimation of justice that night and question how an infection entered my pussy and got hold? Like you, I'm unforgiving. It might be a perversion of my blood inherited like a sore. What language my grandmother spoke, I cannot tell you. On the census records from 1903, the word laborer. My mother is crippled, and I will live in her place, a stain in the hegemony. So I'm going to go to the, the book of love. And I'll end there. I think this is the book of love. <laughs> it's um, just these little fragments of speech. So I'll pause a little between each fragment. 
And in likeness, foreignness, or incompatibility, which strain darkens the hair? If one could be giddy with difference, this is it. In this visioning, everything is slowed down to recognizable speed, a seduction and minutia, tangible, becomes a kind of center. Seer said, betrayal is always a symbol of the soul being upgraded. Unintelligible whisper calls me a long way. Big, big, I say, bigger. Perpetual underneath, even when subtexts are revealed, stuff buried in other stuff. We've come a long way, baby. Your extraordinary promise, sweet, excessive force. I want to know which name, when. High Priestess reveals something the eye has never seen before, hidden document, not shiny or waxen, smells of soft sand. Subliminal fury as in housemaids. What it means to shed dry urge wicker. Was horsehair wad, was restaging every movement forecast exact rendered an abandoned amusement park the ground damp behind dead carousel damp or forests or company or other unchecked situations as a result some heretofore unknown architecture in place of our weapons of security all expertise slips off the ledge. Deception is often a reciprocal activity. When desire is not produced by what you don't have. What it must be like wearing a sweatshirt on a deck in the middle of July, shedding a prescribed melancholy right in front of everyone months of not giving into it, and then without warning, on full blast, so easy. Moths not giving in, escaping into wing fly like shadows of reticence and maybe October. October seems like light years away. A proximity so close you can touch it. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you. I just want to end by saying um, thanks to uh, all of the judges. Thanks to everyone at the Tufts Awards. Thanks to Kate and Kingsley Tufts, wherever they are, for this wonderful prize. Um, and thank you again for this opportunity to present my work in front of you. <laughs>